Aloha, I'm your Minna Van Dyken MD. I'm a surgeon by trade, but my true passion is helping people just like you obtain and maintain optimum health. Today's video is a huge topic, but a very important one, the COVID-19 vaccine. Should you get the vaccine? Is it safe? This has been on my mind a lot lately. I feel like so many people are reluctant to get the vaccine. I find it a concerning trend that we're having trouble here in Hawaii filling all of the vaccination time slots. What's up with this? Currently here in Hawaii and in the US, for example, the vaccine is available to anyone 16 or older. Why are people hesitant to get vaccinated? I hope this video will answer a few questions you might have about the COVID-19 vaccine. We're gonna review a lot of topics today. Here they are. Are the vaccines safe? Are the vaccines effective? Does the vaccine change my DNA? A quick review of how the different types of vaccines work. Who should not get the vaccine? I'll talk about the blood clot issue with the Johnson & Johnson and Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. What about all the people who got COVID anyways after being vaccinated? What about the COVID variant strains? Does the vaccine still work? We discuss Israel as a test case, and then we spend some time talking about the side effects of the COVID vaccine versus long-term effects of having COVID itself. If you don't have enough time to watch the whole video and you just want to get answers to any of the questions above, the timestamps are in the video description below so you can jump ahead and see the topics that you're interested in. Okay, buckle up, here we go. Are the vaccines safe? Scientists began developing vaccines for COVID-19 in January 2020, basically right when the virus started raising alarm bells that it could become a pandemic. Interestingly enough, the platforms for the vaccines that the researchers used have been in play for quite a while. The mRNA vaccines like Pfizer-BioNTech and Moderna, they're the new kids on the block, and they've received the most skepticism in regards to safety. The COVID vaccine may be new, but the mRNA platform is not. Researchers first started developing the mRNA vaccine platform three decades ago in the 1990s. In clinical trials, the mRNA vaccines were given to over 73,000 volunteers. They were found to be overwhelmingly safe. Compare that to the original MMR vaccine. In 1963, it was trialed on 25,000 participants before being rolled out. According to the FDA, no serious safety concerns were observed with the mRNA COVID vaccines. This led to FDA emergency approval. As of today, over 219 million vaccine doses have been given in the United States to date, and 973 million doses have been given worldwide. Over 89 million people have been completely vaccinated against COVID-19 in the U.S. to date, and over 223 million people have been completely vaccinated worldwide. So we've got plenty of data. In the United States, over 95% of vaccine recipients received one of the mRNA vaccines, either Pfizer or Moderna. The CDC has been closely tracking safety and efficacy of the vaccine. And as of right now, the mRNA vaccines continue to be found quite safe. We'll talk about the Johnson & Johnson Janssen vaccine later in the video. Who should not get the vaccine? Well, if you're under 16, you're not eligible yet, but soon you likely will be. Scientists are looking at this population and ensuring safety prior to opening up this age group to vaccination. So basically, if you are 16 or older, the vaccine will be a good choice for you. Of course, check with your personal doctor first to make sure. The question has been raised whether people who are immunocompromised should get the vaccine. Honestly, if you're immunocompromised, it's more of a reason to get the vaccine because getting COVID in an immunocompromised situation could make for a much more severe COVID disease course with a higher risk of complications. How does the mRNA vaccine work? Going back to my biochemistry 101 days, we learned that messenger RNA is only a messenger. It's a set of instructions for the cell that tells it exactly what proteins to make. It's very short-lived. It degrades very quickly after delivering the message, like within minutes after delivering the message. It's important at this point to note that the mRNA does not enter the nucleus of the cell. That's where the DNA lives. The mRNA is broken down in the cytoplasm and the newly formed spike protein is released from the cell. 
It's important to note as well that this is a one-way trip for the mRNA. It's broken down quickly and it never reforms again. In the case of the mRNA vaccine like Pfizer Moderna, the mRNA instructs the cell to make a piece of the spike protein. The body's immune system then learns to mount a defense against that particular spike protein. This spike protein has enough similarities to the spike protein found on the novel coronavirus that your body learns how to be able to fight the real coronavirus. The dendritic cells, a type of immune cell in the immune system, recognizes these spike proteins as foreign and they sound the alarm, which alerts the rest of the immune system, like the B and T cells. The immune system releases powerful substances, chemical messengers that direct immune cells to the site of the vaccination. This causes inflammation and explains the fever, fatigue, and tenderness that some people experience after getting vaccinated. So really, feeling a bit run down and tired after getting the vaccine is a good sign. It tells us your immune system's working. Just to recap, at no point is your DNA changed, and any proteins created by the messenger RNA are subsequently killed off by your immune system. The only residual effects of the vaccine are that your body has learned to mount a defense against the spike protein that your body was instructed to create. As far as the ingredients in the mRNA vaccines, there's not many. They're made up of messenger RNA, salt, sugar, and a fat coating. There's no preservatives or extra ingredients here. This explains the need to keep it cold until just before delivery. Currently, both mRNA vaccines require two shots. The second shot is three to four weeks later, depending on the type of vaccine you get. This three to four week wait is important. This is when your B cells are training and making neutralizing antibodies. These neutralizing antibodies recognize a spike protein, and if you were to get infected, it's these antibodies that block coronavirus from entering your cells and infecting you. So after one vaccine dose, you're getting these neutralizing antibodies, but these antibodies don't last forever. That's why you need the second vaccine dose. It's the second dose that helps generate longer lived immune cells that will recognize the spike protein and protect long-term from infection. Because you already have antibodies on board from the first dose, you'll have a more significant immune system response after the second dose. This immune response really boosts the immune system's memory, and the result is a bigger, better, and faster immune system that has a locked-in memory of the spike protein. Please do not be tempted to avoid the second shot because you want to avoid feeling the side effects. Only one shot does not result in long-lasting immunity. Chances are, to be honest, a third booster shot may be needed around six months after initial vaccination to really create that long-lasting response and to cover the new variant strains. This isn't official yet, but we'll see how the science pans out. How do the adenovirus vector vaccines work? The Johnson & Johnson, Janssen, and Oxford AstraZeneca vaccines are what we call adenovirus vector vaccines. Another example of an adenovirus vector vaccine is the Sputnik vaccine created by Russia. Adenovirus vector vaccines have been around since the 1970s, so they've been safely used for over 50 years. Essentially, these types of vaccines act like delivery shuttles. They use inactivated adenovirus to deliver the gene for the spike protein to your cells. An adenovirus is a type of virus, just like there's a coronavirus or an influenza virus or a rotavirus. Adenoviruses directly deliver DNA that can enter the cell nucleus. This is different from the mRNA class of vaccines. How do the inactivated virus vaccines work? Another vaccine I haven't talked about yet is the CoronaVac made by Sinovac in China. It's currently being used in China, Brazil, Turkey, Indonesia, and 16 other countries. This is a vaccine made from inactivated novel coronavirus. This technology has been around for over 100 years. This is the same technology that Jonas Salk used to develop the polio vaccine in the 1950s. Other examples of inactivated virus vaccines are the rabies vaccine and the hepatitis A vaccine. Basically, researchers took a sample of the SARS-CoV-2 virus from a patient and deactivated it by washing it in a chemical that inactivates it. They then mixed it with an aluminum-based compound that functions to activate the immune system. After vaccination, the dendritic cells, those immune system cells, recognize the invading virus and do what they're supposed to do. They gobble it up. The cell then digests the virus and breaks it down into fragments, which it feeds to the immune system. The immune system then creates antibodies, which recognize the SARS-CoV-2 virus immediately. 
This vaccine's pretty effective. Studies in Turkey and Brazil show that it has an efficacy of 83.5% against COVID-19 symptoms with one or more symptoms and just over 50% against COVID without symptoms. Do the vaccines change my DNA? Some people are worried that the vaccines will change their DNA forever. I already talked about this a little earlier in the video, but let's answer this question for both the mRNA vaccines and for adenovirus vector vaccines. Let's talk about the mRNA vaccines like Pfizer and Moderna first. If you remember from our discussion a minute ago about how mRNA vaccines work, the messenger RNA from the vaccine only goes into the cytoplasm, not the nucleus of our cells. It then degrades rapidly. Because it doesn't enter the nucleus, there's just no way it can change your DNA. What about the adenovirus vector vaccines like the Johnson & Johnson, Oxford, AstraZeneca, and Sputnik? Because the DNA can enter the nucleus, the question has been raised about whether they can alter your DNA. Can they? The answer to that is no. Adenoviruses just don't have the capacity to alter DNA. They just don't have the enzymatic machinery. Additionally, these adenoviruses, they've been engineered. There's multiple chunks of their genome that are deleted, which cripples them, so they cannot replicate and infect. This makes them very safe from an infection standpoint. The adenovirus vector vaccine class has been classified by the FDA as non-integrating, meaning there's never been any evidence in human or animal models of vector-borne DNA integrating into a host. What about the Sinovac vaccine? The Sinovac vaccine is just like the original SARS-CoV-2 virus. It's mRNA and it does not enter the nucleus. It stays in the cytoplasm and it does not change the DNA. So do the vaccines change your DNA? The answer is a resounding no. Let's talk about the blood clot thing with Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca. You probably heard about this. It's been all over the news. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine was rolled out in the United States and over 8 million Americans have received that vaccine. The CDC then began receiving reports of first six, now 15 females who developed a type of blood clot called cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, or CVST for short. It's a type of blood clot in the brain, which is a serious deal. Out of the six women who originally were found to have this, one woman in Nebraska died. It's a pretty serious thing and the CDC put the J&J &J vaccine on hold while it investigated further. Just today, they recommended resuming the vaccine in the US. We do not know at this point in time whether these clots are due to the vaccine itself or not. What we do know, however, is that this happened to 15 women and 13 of the 15 were between the ages of 18 and 49. All of these clots were discovered within six to 13 days after the vaccination. So if this is indeed related to the vaccine, there's a less than two in one million chance of this happening. So it's super rare. Another way to look at it is there is a 0.00018% chance of getting a blood clot when you get a Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Also, it happened in a specific group of people. So if you're not a woman between the ages of 18 and 49, the chances are pretty much zero that you're gonna develop this complication. What if you've already gotten the J&J &J vaccine and you're worried about developing blood clots? I wouldn't panic. But if you received it recently, like within one to two weeks ago, and you're developing headaches, leg or abdominal pain or shortness of breath, I'd see a healthcare provider right away. So I get this question quite frequently. Why should I get the vaccine if there's a chance I could get COVID anyway? What about all the people who got COVID after they got vaccinated? How did that happen? So recently we've been seeing people who get COVID-19 anyways, even though they've been fully vaccinated. We call these breakthrough cases. What's the deal with these? In a nutshell, the vaccine is not 100% effective. It doesn't make you 100% bulletproof against COVID-19. I wish it did. That being said, getting COVID after being vaccinated is extremely rare, at least for now in the US. The good news is that the data shows that vaccinated people had much less severe cases of COVID-19 and a much lower death rate. Let's take the Pfizer Moderna mRNA vaccines, for example. They're about 95% effective. This means that out of every 100 people vaccinated, five would still get COVID if they're exposed. If you amplify this by millions, out of the over 75 million people that have been vaccinated, the CDC has recorded 5,814 breakthrough cases. That means about 4% of the people vaccinated still became infected. 
So at the end of the day, it can be expected that some people will get COVID after they get the vaccine. Just know that less people overall will get it, the cases will be less severe, and the chance of dying from COVID is reduced to almost zero. What about these COVID variant strains? Does the vaccine still work against them? Many people have been asking how well the vaccine works against the new coronavirus variants. These new variants of concern are worrisome because they seem to be more transmissible and also more lethal than the original coronavirus. This is reflected in trials of the AstraZeneca and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine in South Africa. It was found to be less effective in South Africa because the majority of coronaviruses were one of the variants of concern called B1351 or the South African strain. The trials that we have of the Pfizer and Moderna mRNA vaccines were done and tested against the original strain of the coronavirus. This is where we get the 95% efficacy number for these vaccines. Preliminary studies show that these mRNA vaccines are a bit less effective against these variant strains, but they do show that the vaccines are still effective. They also show that the vaccines are effective enough to prevent severe COVID-19 in even the most lethal variants. So it appears that the vaccine, while not 95% effective, is still effective enough to prevent the spread and deadliness of COVID-19. In the future, it's likely that Pfizer and Moderna will modify the mRNA in their vaccine to more effectively fight these variants. Israel is a test case. Let's take Israel and look at it as a test case. On December 20th, a national vaccination program was launched. As of now, over 70% of the entire population of Israel over 16 has been completely vaccinated with the Pfizer vaccine. They are now enjoying a very low COVID infection rate. Just look at this disease curve. As a matter of fact, yesterday was the first day in over one year that Israel reported zero COVID deaths. Israel is becoming a perfect example of how herd immunity can decrease COVID-19 disease burden and spread. Vaccination works. What about the side effects of the vaccine versus not getting the vaccine and getting COVID? The COVID-19 vaccinations are a type of vaccine that's called reactogenic, meaning they're likely to cause only short-term side effects. The most common side effects are things like injection site pain, fatigue, headache, muscle pain, and joint pain. So basically for one to two days after the vaccine, you feel a little tired, but this is transient and it gets better quickly. As we talked about earlier, this is a sign that your immune system is kicking into gear. This doesn't signal the vaccine is unsafe. Compare that to getting COVID. Of course, the disease is a complete spectrum, ranging from no symptoms at all to severe critical illness and death. Fortunately, most people who've had COVID-19 completely recover. Unfortunately though, there's a significant portion of people who have long-term effects. The medical community is calling this long COVID. COVID can cause permanent damage to the heart, lungs, and brain. Let's take, for example, the heart. One study showed that 78% of people who had COVID had cardiac or heart involvement, and 60% had ongoing inflammation of their heart muscle or myocardium long after their COVID infection was over. You may think that this only happened in people who had comorbidities or were not healthy. Wrong. This finding was independent of pre-existing conditions, severity, and overall course of the illness, and the time from original diagnosis. The heart is just one example of one organ and how it fares after COVID. There's many more examples of the same in other organs. I don't know about you, but I'd much rather take a vaccine and deal with the transient side effects as opposed to dealing with permanent changes in my heart or my lungs or my brain from getting COVID or worse yet, risk dying from the disease. So let's wrap it up. By now, most likely you've known someone who's had COVID or who's died from COVID. I've worked on the front lines with COVID patients. I've held their hands when they're having difficulty catching their breath. I've held iPads up while patients are saying their last goodbyes to loved ones. I've taken care of patients in the office suffering from long-term fatigue, lung, and heart problems as a result of this infection. They just want their life back. As of today, global cases are at an all-time high. This pandemic is nowhere close to being over. If you could drastically reduce your chance of suffering from this disease or even prevent your loved ones from getting this disease, why wouldn't you do that? Especially if the vaccines have no known lasting negative side effects. 
I hope this video has cleared a few things up and answered any questions you might have about the nuances of COVID vaccines. What questions have I missed? Let me know in the comments below. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to show us some real support, subscribe. Thanks for watching everyone. Take care, stay safe, and aloha.